times. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going through the book of Hebrews. So we're in chapter 2, and we'll just pick it up where it is. Basically, we saw in chapter 1 how Jesus was proclaimed as God, that all the angels of heaven should worship him, that he is the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. It begins by telling us that Jesus is the one who speaks to us now. Last week, we looked at chapter one. I'm going to go over it very quickly. Don't try to take notes. It won't work. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past by the fathers to the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Jesus was an active agent in creation that tells us. Uh, we talked about the author, which is pretty much unknown. We're going to learn some things as we go through and some hints as to who it might be as we go through and we'll kind of piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, there are people who think it was Paul, people think it was Apollos, people who think it was Luke. Uh, there, there are various opinions and they're basically guessing. So it's not signed. If it was the Apostle Paul, it's the only one he didn't sign because it's rather interesting that he would send a letter to the Hebrews and not sign his name. It might be because of a stigma from what I read. So the audience is obviously these newly born again Christians, these Hebrews who have come out of their habits and rituals and religiosity and have come into a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And he's trying to encourage them because they're tempted to go back. Any of you who have accepted Jesus Christ ever tempted to go back? Only a few of you. Amazing. That's amazing. I've been tempted to go back. Times I've wanted to do crazy things. But luckily the Lord kept me. I'm grateful. And here's the argument. Jesus is the best in every way. He is the greatest. It's not Muhammad Ali. It's all about Jesus. And he has spoken to us in these days through Jesus. And you know... We, we have this tremendous asset called the Bible with 66 books written over thousands of years with more than 40 authors, and it tells about Jesus and how often it's just used for a paperweight and it just kind of sits, you know, on, on the, the seat beside you or it sits on a coffee table or it sits on the dashboard. And we, we have this benefit of getting to know God through Jesus Christ because of what's written in the scriptures. We have such a great benefit to do that. And so that's why I put all the words from the Bible up on the screen. God speaks and he spoke in times past and he has now spoken through his son, singular agent of creation through whom he made the world. It says that he is the express image of his person. Jesus Christ is the exact representation of God on earth. That's pretty good. And so much more than a reflection, he's the very image of God in human flesh. So the deity of Jesus Christ is very well proclaimed here in chapter one, that he is the express image and person of God, the father. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Now, if he's not God, that's an awfully strong statement that everything was created for him because everything was created for God, wasn't it? God was the creator. He created everything for himself, including you and me. And he has absolutely exclusive rights to that, which is why we're here. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Everything holds together by the power of his will. It makes me think, I hope he doesn't sneeze and forget about me or something. That will all be in pieces. We see that Jesus is the only one in heaven in the book of Revelation who is able to open the scroll, the title deed of the earth, because he purchased it with his very blood. So he has the right to take us back from the one whom our progenitors gave us to. If you remember Adam and Eve, they had this choice. You can have anything you want except for that tree. And that's what they went for, is that tree. That sound familiar? It sounds like my kids when they were little. It sounds like my grandkids. Now. 
Sounds like me. Hey, whatever you do, don't look in this drawer in my office. And now you're all wondering, what, what's he got in the drawer? What's, that's, it's an amazing thing. We just want to do the thing we're not supposed to do. Well, praise God that he purchased us back so that by believing in him, we could have life in his name. We see that the angels were involved in the Old Testament and angels were very highly proclaimed in the Old Testament, almost worshiped. And so we took a look at that last week, how Jesus is better than the angels because he's got a better name than them and he's not an angel. Uh, regardless of what people might knock on your door and tell you, Jesus is God incarnate, just as we've read in the previous verses. So Jesus is the greatest. We looked at the Old Testament passages, seven of them that demonstrate Christ's superiority, that he's better than anyone, including Muhammad Ali. There were none of the angels that he ever say, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for an inheritance. There is nowhere where any other angel is lifted up at any particular part like Jesus was. And even Lucifer, the, fall, the fallen one, who is an angel who has fallen. And then Jesus, when he is baptized, if you remember, the voice comes from heaven. He says, this is my son whom I am well pleased. So there's, there's this authentication of who Jesus is right at his baptism. And there's also one more when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. The voice comes and Peter thought it'd be a great idea to put three booths up. You know, we, we'll camp out just the four of us, you know, Jesus, the three disciples and you. And, oh, look, there's Elijah and Moses. Yeah, let's, let's, I'll build you each a house. You, you must have been a carpenter. I'll build you each a house and, and, you know, we'll just hang up here so we don't have to go back down there with those losers. Um, the other disciples. You ever wonder what it was like to be one of those disciples? Yeah, where's Jesus? Where's your master? Oh, he took Peter, James, and John, and he went up on the hill. So what did he leave you here for? You, you guys never wonder about these things. Okay, I do. <laughs> I just wonder if I'd be one of, the, one of the three he'd have to specially supervise or whether he could leave me alone. <laughs> Jesus is God's son declared by him even while he was here. And we see... Jesus is worshiped. It says, let all the angels worship him. To which one of the angels did he ever say that to? Even Michael the archangel or Gabriel, none of that ever happened. Jesus is unique and he's not an angel. And he's trying to convince these Hebrews that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the creator. He is God in the flesh and he can be worshiped. And you don't have to go back to all of that mess that you left behind. If any of you have come from a religious background, uh, perhaps a Catholic background or something with smells and bells and kneeling and gyrations and, you know, movements and, you know, you, and, and there's the music, you know, a pipe organ and all of that. It's easy to say, wow, you know, I, I went to your church, but it's like really casual. Like you didn't wear a robe. You don't have like the bling. You don't speak Latin usually. You know, like, I, I kind of miss that. I really think I want to go back. Any of you got that? No. Father, forgive me, I have sinned. No. It's been 27 years since my last confession, and you don't have enough time for me to be honest. <laughs> so what, you know, should I just cut my hand off, and that's how I'm going to pay for my sin? You may have a background where you've come from something which maybe you've got pressure from your family. Hi, you could come back. You don't have to chase this Jesus. You might have pressure from friends, relatives. You might have pressure. And yet, Jesus is who Jesus is. He is the Savior of the world. And he's the one who is worthy to be followed. And he's the one who's worthy of all of our life. And if, and if you like religion, if you like all the forms and all the pictures and all the shadows, I, I'd rather be married to my wife than her shadow. Right, and I'd rather have a relationship with Jesus than have a religious a, a religious expression about Jesus. It's a different thing having a relationship versus a religion. 
A religion is something you do, and usually you think you get points for. But I digress. The angels are servants, and Jesus came as Lord, and yet he served. And that can be confusing, right? Jesus came and washed feet. He did that because he purposely lowered himself. In fact, he poured himself into a human body and did that. It's not because he is a servant. It's because he chooses to be. There's a difference. Either you're a slave because you're forced to be, or you're a slave because you choose to be. I could tell you it's much happier to choose to be. And that is absolutely not all. To the son, God says, your throne, O God. Isn't that interesting that God the father is talking to God the son. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. It's a, it's a very powerful passage in the Old Testament about the deity of Jesus Christ. And in the beginning, the Lord laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the work of your hands. The Jesus was there. There is nothing that has been made that has not been made through him and for him. That's a very strong statement about the deity of Jesus Christ as well. So anybody comes knocking on your door, you could just open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12 and say, let's, or chapter two and say, let's read. And you can just go through these things. It's real simple. I don't remember this last week. Do you? Do you remember this last week? Of course you do. Angels are not what you think they are. Sometimes we think they're little cherubs, and they're not. They're, they do battle. One of them killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. It's not somebody I want to see. Yeah, I, uh, Gabriel's okay. Gabriel's the one with the messages, but not Michael. Michael's the fighting angel. I don't want to see him. And they are always doing God's bidding. That's what their job is. And I, I'm just going to move forward. So what we talked about last week in 14 verses is all of this. God speaks through his son. Being God, he's our redeemer. He buys us back. He's better than the angels. It's a father and son relationship. He's not a created being. He's the firstborn and accepts worship which only God is worshiped. Angels never are. Angels are only servants administering judgment. The son of God has a scepter. In other words, he's in charge and he has an everlasting kingdom. In fact, he's going to be seated on a throne the next time you see him. He's valued above all. And Jesus is the creator. Scriptures are very clear about stating that. Always will be because he has no end and will be one at the end of the creation. He's the one who will sit in judgment on us and angels Serve God in us, and Jesus is not him. And Muhammad Ali is not the greatest. Jesus is. All right, so this week we're going to be into chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the words spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward... How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So we're given this warning. It's actually the first of many warnings about drifting, the danger of drifting. Now, is he speaking to Christians or non-Christians? He's speaking to Christians and saying, be careful and give careful heed to what you've heard because we could drift. You guys know what that is, right? Okay, good. Because that word is only used one time here in the New Testament. So it, be careful. It's one of the warnings that you'll find in the scriptures. And it's drifting. This is drifting. But it's a completely different kind of drifting. This is the only time it's used in the New Testament because drifting leads to accidents, doesn't it? Drifting leads to accidents. So first he says, therefore must we give more earnest heed to the things which you've heard. So we must bear the admonition of listen, 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 listen. 
When the scripture says, listen up, it's important that we listen up, right? If your little kid is just trying to get out of a spank and says, listen, Linda, 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 listen. <laughs> Which if you don't know this kid, he's going to be a car salesman, I think, when he gets older. <laughs> Drifting isn't about cars. It's actually about something that's not moored. It's a boat where you may have gone fishing and, and you thought you tied it up. And the next time you come back to find your boat, it's not there because you didn't tie it off. And the current and the wind just took it out. That's drifting. Any of you know what drifting is? Any of you drifted in your life? Yeah. Any of you who made a New Year's resolution, I'm sure, have drifted. I'm going to work out five days a week. I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I'm going to stop bad habits. I'm going to start doing good things. I'm... Yeah, and then you drift. Usually 10 days. 10 days. I forget, after 17 days, I think there's only 15% uh, of the people actually keep their commitments. So uh, that's how good we are at it. So be careful not to drift. If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, in other words, if what they said happened and it, and it meant something because it was from God, and every transgression and disobedience received its reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How are we going to escape? Do you think we have the most information out of any generation that's ever lived on the face of the planet? Yeah. How many of you have a phone? Yeah, I hope it doesn't ring while we're here, but you have a computer in your pocket. I mean, 20 years ago, people would say, who wants to carry around a computer in your pocket? Besides, it's so big. Now everything's changed. How will we escape when we stand before God because we know so much more than all of our predecessors? We have so much more, except we also have more distraction, don't we? Oh, what's on TikTok? Oh, what, what's on YouTube? Oh. What's on Instagram? Oh, what's a... And you can, you can spend three hours and then go, I don't even know what I looked at. <laughs> it's the next best way to waste your life. If we neglect so great a salvation, how will we escape? Which was first began to be spoken of the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. I want you to notice that the author... The author is a second generation Christian. It's not one of the disciples because it was spoken of by the Lord to the disciples and we heard it from them. Do you see that? So that gives us a hint as to who wrote this. Narrows it down just a little. There's 11 people that are not suspect anymore. But anyway, there's this hint at authorship do you remember when Peter and John went to the temple to pray? It was in the middle of the day. It was early on in the, in the beginning of the church. They were still meeting in the synagogue. And they, they went in, and there was this guy begging out in front of the temple, at the synagogue. And so he's just, you know, he's got his hand out like this, and th those people rarely make eye contact. And Peter says, look at us. And he looks up and he looks at him and he says, listen, silver and gold, we don't have any. But in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and be healed. And he takes him by the hand and he yanks him up in the air and suddenly the dude's standing and he was completely lame. He was healed in an instant. And the guy starts shouting and yelling and jumping up and down and they say, hey, we're going into the synagogue. Come on, you're healed. You don't have to be out here. You can go in now. And they all go in. The guy's leaping and jumping and screaming and people are like, I know that dude. I just passed him. He's out there every single week. God confirmed the power of God through the disciples with miracles. It was something that confirmed everything that they said, that everything they said was true because there was no other way to explain somebody who just could not walk suddenly jumping up and down. And God does a lot of that stuff as you read through the book of Acts. It's absolutely phenomenal what God did and allowed them to bear witness with these, witness, uh, with these miracles. In Acts chapter 5, and it, this is what's said of the first century church. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. 
And they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities of Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The word all means all. That's all that it means. They were all healed. Wow. That's pretty phenomenal, don't you think? That if everybody that had an issue, boom, 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 healed, healed, healed. Every single one. Now, there's a lot of hokey stuff going on around the world where, well, I hope it takes. See you later. Thanks for your donation. There's a lot of hucksters out there. But I'll tell you what, when you're on the front line, God pours his spirit out. We're certainly not on the front line. People say, well, Pastor Dave, why don't you think God does miracles today? So we don't need it. I get a headache, I take a pill. I get something hurt, I go to a doctor. I don't pray. I don't come before the church. I don't ask the elders to pray over me with the oil and, and the, the prayer offer in faith will heal such a one. I don't do that. I go to a doctor. So why has God got to step in and do something phenomenal? We don't trust him. That's why. Anyway, this is my opinion. But I think it's a good one. How can we escape the natural consequences of neglect? Now, he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's not talking about uh, never going to heaven and you blew it, you made a mistake, you're done. No, he's saying, how are, how are we going to escape the natural consequences of not doing what God would have us do? You know, ignorance is something that, biblical illiteracy is something that affects the church tremendously. And I... I, I'm, I'm sad to say that uh, I'm, I might be part of that. I don't know everything I should know. Do you? But I think we need to live up to at least what we know because I think most of us are more well taught than we behave. I think most of us know more than we do. Does that make sense? You're all very quiet today. I knew I shouldn't have worn a black shirt with no collar. I just, I just knew that. In verse 5, it says, For he has not put the world to come, which we speak of, we're talking about heaven, in subjection to angels. In other words, angels aren't in charge when we move off this planet. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. And you put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Yeah, that's from Psalm 8. If you guys are following along in, on Thursdays, we, we just went through this. It's an interesting psalm that David's writing about something that's going on right now, but he's also talking about something else that's going on in the future. A lot of prophecies are that way. They're written at a certain time about a certain thing, and yet they speak of something that's further off. And it's obviously written by David. So, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. I don't know if you guys are into astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, which is different. But if you get to look at some of the things that are out there, it's absolutely fabulous. And if you start looking at some of the relative sizes of things, I mean, our, our planet's like a really nice planet, right? But next to the sun, we're like a grain of sand. And the sun is huge. And our sun is a small sun. The sun burns 1,200,000 tons of material a second. 1,200,000 tons of material a second. Nobody's been there, but it's an estimate. So it's interesting. If you take 1,200,000 tons of material 
a second and you rewind the clock a million years, the earth is touching the sun. So much for them billions of years theory. It's a giant candle out in space. If it was billions of years old and everything was the same, we'd be, we'd be done. The, the oceans would be boiling and we would be a crisp. Just saying. Yes, I'm prone to wander, Lord. I feel it. It says, it says here, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. We talked about that on Thursday. If you don't know what it means, good. Anyway, do you recognize some of these great people here? Do you recognize these, these folks? In, in the... Yeah. Why in the world a God that's so big that he can't be contained in the universe can be seen by a child and believed on to salvation. How God speaks even to children. I, any of you have had children and, and perhaps they grew up in a Christian home. It's a, it's a really interesting thing for your kids to reprove you. Did you ever get, oh, Daddy, that's a bad word. Uh-oh. I forgot they were in the back seat. Some of you understand what I'm saying. That never happened to me, but I knew one of you did. It's an amazing thing how God can speak through a child. He can speak to a child and have a relationship with a child. I just uh, think that's amazing that, the, that the, the largest, most significant being in all of the world stoops low to speak to a child. And what they're doing right now in the back with the kids in those Sunday school rooms is a, a beautiful thing. I hope you appreciate it if you have kids. But he ordains strength through the little ones. And of course, he created everything. Now, he says in Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you should visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. Why would God bother with you? Why would he bother with me? We're like so insignificant compared to the universe. I mean, when you talk about light years, I mean, I, I can't even, I don't even know if the, that trajectory could be held together with the molecules in my body. I definitely have to lose weight. But get shot off into space and reach light speed, 185, anyway. You start thinking about how big everything is and how far apart it is. And that's not God, by the way. That's just something he made. That's like walking past a house that's in construction. It's one of many. And you can just go and go and go and go and go. And when we leave this life, we're going to step out of time and matter. And we're going to step into eternity. And David thinking about probably looking at the night sky and looking at everything that God made and all of the variety. It's like... Who am I? You know, sometimes we tend to be the people that we think of the most. Well, probably not you good people, but like if you ever have a, if you're ever in a picture with a whole bunch of people and somebody says, hey, yeah, I got a picture. Who do you look for first? <laughs> oh, I look terrible in that picture. Yeah, it's you. It's pretty much you. You're the center of the universe and everything orbits you. I get it. You're like everybody else. But David, when he looks away from that and he looks at everything that God created, he goes, the sun, the moon, the stars that you've ordained, who is man that you even think of him? It's like you being concerned with a pile of ants on the sidewalk. And the distance is further between God and us. And yet he has put his image into us as he created us. And he's created a point of contact, as smart as it is. And the son of man that you should visit him. You've made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You know, we really have a position of prominence that God has put us here for, even though we ruined everything. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, that God poured himself into human flesh. For the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor, that he by grace, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus came and took dominion. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Everything was good. You never heard anything about, oh no, a lion's coming, Lord, what do we do? I, I think they were completely, they had dominion over everything. And all the animals listened to them. Until sin came and suddenly the animals said, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> and everything got ruined. I think that's absolutely amazing. And I see in the millennium, there's going to be all sorts of relationships that you would never think of. Like a little child's going to play in a viper's den. Because there's no harm going to come to the child. I, I just, when I read about all of that stuff that has yet to be revealed and come, I think, wow, this is going to be cool. I want to be in control of all the animals, don't you? Yes. You ever seen like a bear and you just go like, I want to go hug that bear. <laughs> but I know he'll eat me. So I'm not going to do that. And they have bear sightings everywhere. They, they sent me a thing on my phone and said I can get my bear license to, to hunt bear. I guess they're trying to find people to get rid of them. But I, I see some of these giant majestic animals and, um, you know, you see it all the time. You know, people go through these drive through zoos and they think these animals are harmless and they have a giant bag of food. <laughs> and, and the giraffe comes in the sunroof and like starts to maul them and the tongue's this long and they're like, no, or monkeys, you know, tearing your clothes off and pulling your hair and stealing your purse and running off. That's not going to happen. And it's interesting because I, I never thought about this, but when Jesus came, he took control of animals and, and in a way that I never saw before because he's the second Adam, or at least he's referred to as the second Adam. He's like, the, it's what Adam should have done initially is what Jesus did when he came because he succeeded in resisting temptation and because he was the son of God. But did you know Jesus was in control of a rooster? Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny me three times that you know me. Is it that God knew about it or God made it happen? What about a fish? Peter was harassed by some, you know, some Jews in the temple. And they said, listen, does your master pay taxes? And he goes, well, I don't know. Let me go ask him. So Peter goes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, do we pay taxes? <laughs> and Jesus asked the question, do you think, who do you think should pay the taxes? The relatives, the son of a landowner, or do you think strangers? And, and Peter said, well, strangers, of course. He goes, okay, well, then we're okay, we're cool. But just so that nobody gives you any lip, what I want you to do is go down, take your fishing pole, go in, go fishing. The first fish you, can't, you catch, open his mouth, and there'll be a coin in there. And it'll just so happen to be enough for you and me. So you know what Peter did? He said, no. No, he went and did it. I think he probably did it as a lark, like, all right, let's see. <laughs> Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. See, it's in Matthew 17, 27. I didn't make the story up. It's right there. Jesus took control of the animals. I think that's pretty cool. Something else, in Mark 1.13, it says that Jesus, he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. How many of you never saw that before? He was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So while he was out there, because if you're going to spend 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness, you're going to run into some really weird stuff, especially when you're sleeping. Because he slept out there. Remember, he was fasting, wasn't eating. So he was out there with the wild beasts and no problem. I think that's pretty cool. This gets me excited. 
Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt. And you say, well, it's a domesticated animal. But the scripture is very clear. It says in Luke 19, 30, go into the village opposite you where you will enter and you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Now, if you know anything about sitting on an animal that's never had anyone sit on them, <laughs> loose it and bring it here. And they're like, Jesus, what in the world do you want to do with this colt that's never been ridden? And he gets on it and he has no problem. Why else would it be put in there that he sat on a colt that's never been ridden? Why would it say it's never been ridden? Why would you put that there? Because I think it's a little peek into the future. I, I'm sorry. I get excited when I study the Bible and I find these interesting things. What about fish? Luke 5, 4 to 8. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Because Jesus began speaking to people. And as he spoke to people, people began to gather around. And Jesus kind of started backing up and people kept coming and people were closing in. And he kept backing up and he kept backing up. And finally, he was up against the ship. So he got in the boat and it happened to be Peter's boat. Just so happened to be Peter's boat. This is before he called him. And then he's, Peter's over there mending his nets and he's like, there's somebody jacking my boat. <laughs> Pushes through the crowd and says, what, what's going on? He goes, Peter, put out into the deep. Let's go. And so he does. But Simon answered and he said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. So he's like, we've already been fishing and there's nothing here. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Greater than their capacity. That's the kind of a God we serve. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat and they came to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink and Simon Peter saw it and he fell down at Jesus' knees saying depart from me for I am a sinful man Lord imagine Jesus comes and finds you and he does something far better than you've ever done at a time when nobody should be out fishing when you've gotten nothing listen when Jesus comes into your life that happens amen so Jesus was in control of the animals. I just think, I just think that's pretty cool because I look forward to that. I want to hug a bear. Anyway. <laughs> and what about the weather? You remember Jesus more than one time. He was on the Sea of Galilee and a storm whipped up. The one time he was with his disciples and they were on the water and Jesus was asleep on a cushion. That's exactly how it's written. He was asleep in the stern on a cushion. The gall of this guy, preaching, teaching, healing all day long. We take one drive over, you know, the water and, and he's asleep. <laughs> Leaves us to do all the work. Well, it's just like Jesus. Well, they were in the middle of a storm and it's funny. They don't wake them until they're in the middle of sinking. Peter says, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care? Any of you ever cry out to God and say that? Don't you care? Don't you care? And Jesus gets up, probably wipes his eyes, looks around, and he speaks to the wind. Just like that, stops. Wind and the waves, done. He arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. By the way, the original language, that's exactly what he speaks to possessed people. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So Jesus is in even control of the weather. So you could make plans in the millennium. You could say, don't worry about it. I can, I can, I can change the weather. I'm looking forward to that. Because Jesus came back with all the, the restraints that a human being would, uh, he's the second Adam. Anyway, I just think that's pretty amazing. You're going to have a new body too, by the way. It's going to be your old body, but it's going to be 2.0. <laughs> so Jesus takes care of even the weather. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some cool stuff in the future. We, we don't see that everything's under us like the scripture speaks of, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, and for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Well, that was quite a taste, wouldn't you say? 
He swallowed up death completely. It's a figurative way of speaking. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I find that so fascinating. How do you make God more perfect? Well, see, God taking on human form suffered. Do you think he suffered as God? No, he didn't suffer as God in heaven. But he stepped down from that and volunteered, said, pick me, I'll go. And he came down to suffer and die for us. He never had to do that before. Because God has never had to, nor should he ever have to, suffer abuse from anybody. But he did. On purpose. For you. So that you wouldn't have an eternity separated from him. That's the greatest news you'll ever hear. That God came in the person of his son and died for you in your place. If you give your life to him. If you receive that gift that he offers. But it has to be received. Like a bank account. You got to write a check. Hebrews 5, 8, 9. Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, we also learn by suffering, don't we? Yes. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That's the other side of suffering. Ephesians 1, 19 says, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet. Interesting, in Ephesians, they're actually referring back to that passage, that when David was writing about man and being thought of in Psalm 8 and everything being under his feet, it was looking future to what would happen to man, but also was speaking of what occurred with Christ, that everything was under his feet, including dominion over the evil one, right? You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. Amen. Jesus has dominion. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's an interesting description of the church, the fullness of who Christ is. That's our goal, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I want to be like Jesus. I want to be the right part. I want to do my right thing as I'm standing up here and teaching you guys. I would hope that you guys want to do your part. And we're all part of his body. For both he who sanctifies, who's Jesus, and those who are being sanctified, which is us, are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given to me. Now, what the author is doing is he's pulling Old Testament passages that these Hebrews would know. You and I were like, oh, that's nice. What the heck is that? Mostly the Psalms. So he's putting this all together. The one who sanctifies and the one who is being sanctified are all one. Jesus prayed in John 17, 11, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Did you know Jesus prayed for you before you were born? He prayed for you. He prayed for us. And I'm grateful because if it was up to us, we'd ruin this place. But he prayed for us that we might be one. You probably remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. John 13, 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's such a touching thing for me to read. And I don't know if you've ever read that before. 
Lord noticed that before in John 13. It says that he wanted to express his love and he expressed it to the end. Even with Judas, Judas approaches him and he goes, Judas, are you going to betray the son of man with a kiss? And that was the guy who held the money. Jesus put the treasurer, put the treasury in Judas's pocket. He said, here, you take care of all our money. I thought he was God. He should know better. I think he was showing grace. I prefer to think he was showing grace. And as much then as children have partaken of flesh and blood and himself, likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their life subject to bondage. These passages are way heavier than I have time for. Okay? So I just want to I just want to let you know I'm trying to keep on time here but these things are deep and rich and I would hope that you would go home maybe today even and read this for yourself because what God has done for us is absolutely amazing. We are flesh and blood human beings. And God said the only way I'm going to be able to win them over is if I become one like them. I got to put on flesh. And that's what he did. That's why Christmas is so cool. It's not just the sales. You guys are a really tough crowd. Isn't that a nice picture? I thought you'd all go, aw, but you didn't. Okay. God became man and took on flesh. The creator became a creature. The one who hung the stars lay helpless in a manger. The one who who we teach our children is so big, so strong, and so mighty, became so tiny, so weak, and so powerless. The king of the angels was made a little lower than the angels. The creator of time entered time. The one whose everlasting arms are underneath his people lay vulnerable in his mother's arms. I didn't write that. I had to put somebody's name on that. But it's an amazing thing to think that God stooped that low for us. And he did. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, when people go to hell, they do it by walking over the dead body of Jesus. And have released those who through fear of death all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Do you know how many things people do because of fear? That because they're afraid to die? There are some people that won't get on a plane. Do you realize that Jesus has freed us from the fear of death? I'm not going to enjoy the process of dying, however it happens. I mean, I just, I just heard a story of a guy who got struck by a lightning bolt. That was it. He was gone. Lights out, literally. Amazing. And there were 17 other people that died with him around him from a lightning bolt. That's, you know, that's God just saying, it's time to come home. I'm going to make it easy on you. I, I wouldn't mind that. That's, you know, it's that long, lingering, suffering sort of thing that I wonder, you know, could I just go in my sleep, Lord? That would be nice. I like sleep. Sleep is good. But you know, I shouldn't fear death. I should fear death like I fear a nap because it's called falling asleep, right? In Jesus. In Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Everybody's jacked up, messed up, twisted up, and broken. Can I, can I get a hand? Can I get a witness? Is somebody else broken there? All, by the way, the scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is genetically mutated with sin. In Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin, in other words, you get paid for because you have this sin in your life, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You see, what we earn because we're broken, twisted sinners is death, and we deserve that. And yet there's this free gift that Jesus gives of life. 
And we get freed from the fear of death because we don't have to worry about facing the Lord at the end of our life because the pain of death is sin, isn't it? I mean, I wouldn't mind saying goodbye to people that I love if I knew I was going to see the Lord and I was going to see them again. I'm good with that part. I don't want to stand before God and he goes, you. <laughs> what, Lord, what? You. That's what I don't want to find. I want to find one who has his arms open and he says, welcome home. And I need that. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You got to understand the reason you're going to get prosecuted and the reason that you're guilty is because God has told you what you should and shouldn't do. And that's the thing that makes us a sinner. We know better, right? We do things we know we should not do. I bought this shirt as a double extra large with a suspicion it might not fit. <laughs> and I'm trying to resist going to a triple extra large. <laughs> the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory over death. I don't have to worry about death anymore. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you have a personal relationship with him, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear somebody you love dying who knows the Lord. It's those that don't. Those that don't, we should be concerned about and not neglect those such a greatest salvation even for them. Romans 6, 13 and 14. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. In other words, we don't do everything we feel like doing. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. By the way, that's how you can get away from being filthy rags. Make them meaningful gifts. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Because I asked Jesus to come into my life, drugs, alcohol, carousing, being a criminal, drug addict, maniac, lover of violence, God saved me and changed my heart. He made me a new person, and now I'm standing up here, I'm a pastor. Amen. That's what should be in my yearbook, least likely to become a pastor. <laughs> and what I have to do, what I do now is I give God my life because he bought me with his very blood. God came down and visited in the form of his son and died for me so that I might have a relationship with him. And I'll tell you what, I take it for granted sometimes. I wake up and I'm just thrilled with my life. I, I, I love my wife. I love my kids, my grandkids. I love my life. And, you know, things happen and you're like, small thing. It's a small thing. <gasps> but it's a tragedy. It's a small thing. If you're looking at eternity, you're looking at the universe, you're looking at God, everything's a small thing. Yeah. Everything's a small thing. But you know, even a penny is bigger than the sun when you hold it up here. And that's what we do, isn't it? Jesus has set us free and our response is out of a love for him, Lord, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Even if I don't want to do it. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, your court date, it's not just been erased, you've been declared innocent. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know what the law of sin and death is? All have sinned. And the wages of sin is death. We're set free from that. You should tell somebody. Amen. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels. We're back to comparing Jesus to angels. Indeed, he does not give aid to angels. He does not give aid, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest 
and things pertaining to God. To make propitiation. There's a word you don't read every day. For the sins of the people. It's a substitutionary provision. In that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. I, I could talk all day just on this verse, but I won't. Do you realize that we have aid, that Jesus will give us aid if we ask him? I take it for granted that I can pray about anything and the Lord will hear me because he loves me. And it's not because I'm such a great guy, because you guys know better. But all I have to do is make a phone call. It's better than 911. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So where are you going to go? Not Ghostbusters. Where are you going to go? You're going to go to Jesus, because he's the only one that can change anything anyway. And I don't know about you, but I'm one of those kind of guys that's like, all right, I can fix this. I can handle that. What do you got? Oh, yeah, I got, uh, I got three refrigerators. No problem. I, I can lift all three of them. No problem. Just bring them up. Because I'm, I'm a bonehead. I try to handle everything myself. And then I have a, a good loving wife who says, honey, your back is not in good shape. You should not be doing these things. Just like, a, like Sam I am. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. The Bible says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and help in time of need. And he's explaining this to the Hebrews that you have this high priest. Now, they would have to go once a year and make a sacrifice for their sins, the, the, the one sin done. If they did something wrong during the year, they had to bring a sacrifice for that too. And another one, and another one, and another one. It's like, yeah, 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 I'm back. Sorry, it only took me about seven hours to screw it up again, you know. But once a year, they would bring a lamb they would put their hands on the top of this live lamb and the, the priest would gut this thing underneath your hands and it was a picture and a transference of your sin onto that innocent animal that this innocent animal shed its blood and you, were, you, you made it happen because you brought it in and it had to be perfect in every way. So you took the best thing that you had in your flock and you sacrificed it for your sin. What an awful thing. You don't talk about a guilty conscience. I run over a squirrel and I feel like a piece of dirt. <laughs> Imagine bringing a perfect lamb and putting your hands over its head. And as it's trying to struggle and get away, it gets gutted underneath your hands. And they would have to do that every single year. And the priest would be there to help you do this and perform this ceremony. Why in the world would God prescribe such a bloody sacrifice? Because later he would send his own son to do that very thing. And by having faith in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, my sins are done away with. That's the whole purpose of everything that you see in the Old Testament, all the weird things that maybe you don't understand. There's a purpose in them. But Jesus becomes our high priest and the sacrifice. It's not just that he's the mediator between us and God, but he becomes the sacrifice as well. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. If any of you ever want to climb Mount Everest, it's going to cost you like 10 grand. And you get a Sherpa. You get somebody that's been up there before, right? And they know all the right equipment. They carry your stuff. They're usually these, these shorter men, but they carry packs on them that are you know, three times their size and, and their legs are super strong. That's somebody you want to go with. And I can tell you, if you want to get out of a sinful thing that you're in, Jesus is the one to go to. He should be our Sherpa if we're trying to climb that mountain because he resisted sin in every way. He, he was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. So who better to tell you what to do? He was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was tempted of the devil. Do you remember that? And he used the scriptures to fend him off. And at the end of it, it says the angels came and ministered to him. In other words, they brought him a happy meal or something. But Jesus resisted sin in ways that you and I don't even understand. You, you're not tempted to make a rock into a bread. 
You can't do that. The devil never says, hey, listen, if you, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. It doesn't tempt you that way. It takes much smaller things for me. Maybe not you good people. <laughs> so Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. And in the verses that we went through, beware of dangerous drifting. And the angels that delivered the law, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God has been our witness through signs and miracles and gifts. The scriptures have them all recorded like any other historical document. Angels are not as high as Jesus. What is man that you are mindful of him? Jesus made himself lower to ultimately get lifted up even higher. So that is chapter two. Next week, we're going to do chapter three. You probably already knew that. Why should I even show you a slide? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, if you would, please, and we'll do one more song.